Praise the Lord. We thank God for those songs this morning. Thank God for the blood of the precious Savior that washes our sins white, whiter than snow. Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. If you would uh, like to open your Bibles, please. And those of you watching online, we do encourage you uh, to take your Bible and open it with us to Ephesians chapter 6. And those of you who are able, we'll ask you to stand at this time. Before the entire world was impacted by this coronavirus, we were coming down to the end of a series of sermons on the whole armor of God. And when everything went crazy, we moved with the times and preached what I believe to be messages that were pertinent to the situation at hand. But this morning I'd like to finish up our look at the whole armor of God. We've covered all the pieces of the armor and the only thing that's left to address that we haven't addressed is prayer. So by the grace of God, we're going to preach about prayer this morning. So let's read our scripture first in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10 and forward. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. There's some preparation involved in this. Verse 14 says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, and therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. That's all I'm going to read now. I will ask you to be seated in the presence of the Lord, and may God bless the reading of His Word. And may God bless the hearers of the Word of God today. We're talking about prayer this morning. So what is prayer? Prayer is simply a solemn address to a holy God. I know there are a lot of people in this world today who are praying to false gods and to dead gods. But in our context, when you and I as Christians pray, we are making an address to the triune God, the one and only true and the living God. Amen. Amen. So prayer has components of expressing adoration for God. When you come before God and you tell God how much you adore Him, that's one component of prayer. Prayer has a component of confessing our sins to God. Prayer has a component of making supplication for mercy and grace. Prayer has a component of interceding for other, other people. Prayer has a component of offering thanksgiving unto the true and the living God and just simply expressing gratitude toward God for all of His many benefits. Thank God I'm glad for the many benefits of the one true God this morning, aren't you? So, for a person to pray to God, there must be an acknowledgement of His existence. Because let's face it, it would be totally absurd uh, for you to pray to a God that you don't believe in. It would be absurd for you to pray to a God that you don't even believe exists. And for a person to pray, they have to at least have a hope that God knows them and that God cares about them. But not only that, they have to have confidence and an expectation that God is able and willing to respond to you when you pray to Him. It would be absurd. And it would be a waste of time to pray to a God when you don't have confidence in that God's ability to actually do anything. 
So one writer gave this illustration. A modern fighter plane is a fearsome weapon with its combination of cannons, missiles, and bombs. But what happens if the plane suddenly loses electrical power? The armaments still have their theoretical capacity to defend the plane, but because they are no longer under the control of the pilot, their effectiveness is reduced to zero. The plane may still look fearsome, but it's actually worthless at that point. And that's the way it is for you and I as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. You could get up every single moment of your life and put on the whole armor of God, but none of it's going to do you one bit of good if we do not have contact. <coughs> Pardon me. If we don't have contact with our Father in Heaven. Amen. So, Paul is clearly telling the Ephesians that the armor of God is not enough. It's not enough for you to put on the whole armor of God. That armory needs to be under the control of the pilot. That means you and I have to be in close contact with God. So how, how do we get in contact with God? How do we remain in contact with God? Well, we get in contact with God and we remain in contact with God through prayer. Amen. But that's a challenge for a lot of us today, isn't it? We try all sorts of things to be people who pray. We try to set aside times to pray. We try to block out times to pray. We try to pray just the right way. But how much of this is actually depending upon God? I think most Christians today, thank you brother, I think most Christians today would say that they desire to be people who pray better. So with this in mind, let's go to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. And read verses 9 through 15. Luke chapter 11, beginning to verse number 9. Here the Lord is speaking. He says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Amen. Amen. And He was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. But some said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of devils. Well, here in these verses of Scripture... Jesus did not give some type of secret formula for prayer. He did not provide them with a manuscript of words that needed to be recited in order for them to pray. And neither does the Apostle Paul. But Paul does mention four elements that ought to, ought to characterize prayer for the Christian. First he says that we are to pray always with all prayer and supplication. Secondly, we are to pray in the Spirit. Thirdly, when we pray, we are to watch thereunto with all perseverance. And fourthly, we are to make supplication for all saints. So let's look at the first one. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Why would Paul write to pray always? Well, very simply, it's because there were some in Paul's day, and there are still in our day, some people who just never pray at all. They never pray. They never pray whatsoever. They never so much as take a few seconds out of their time to utter a few words to their Creator. There are some people who never pray. And then there are some people who only pray when they're in trouble. Amen? They only pray when the bills are passed due. They only pray when the car breaks down. They only pray when the kids are sick. 
They only pray when they need something. They only pray when something's going wrong. And outside of that, they never think about talking to God. Yeah, that's right. So why does this matter? It matters because your prayer is rooted in your relationship with the Lord. If you never pray, do you think that that shows that you have a very strong relationship with God? I don't think so. It's the person who has a strong relationship with God who will be talking with God on all kinds of occasions and not just when they're in trouble and not just when things are going wrong. We need to be people who pray at all times. That's right. The good times and the bad times. And we should never let any particular time or situation hinder us or halt our communication with the Heavenly Father. We need to be people who pray always. Amen? I need your prayers this morning. I wasn't expecting it, but I'm having some serious issues with my voice this morning. So I'd appreciate your prayers today. The Bible says in James chapter 5 and verse number 13, I'm going to read it to you. You could write it down and look at it, look at it later if you like. The Bible says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So, James says here that there needs to be prayer when we're sick and afflicted. But not only in times of trouble... Because he also says that we are to sing praises unto God when we're married and when we're joyful. We should pray, not just when things are going wrong, but when we're in good spirits, when things are going well, when we're prospering. We need to pray when the bills are paid. We need to pray when the car is running well. We need to pray when the kids are healthy. We need to pray when everything's going well at our job. We need to pray at all times and in all types of situations. Think about it like this. Ian DeGuid pointed this out. Most of us don't have a close relationship with the federal government. Amen? Amen. We know it exists and we know that it will influence your life. But in moments of drastic hardship and severe challenges... What we might do is we might write a letter to the senator. We might try to call the congressman. We might make a petition to them asking them to come along and intercede on our behalf. We may complain about the government. We may complain to the government when things are going wrong. But during those times of personal victory, when your children begin to walk and take their first steps, you're not taking a picture of that and sending it to the congressman. Amen? When you get that promotion at, at your job, you're not calling your senator to try to tell your senator about that. Why is this? It's because we assume that they don't care to hear about any of those things. But God, my dear friend, like a good parent, He wants to hear from His children anytime, all the time, any time of the day or not. At night it makes no difference what the occasion is because God is a good Father and, and this is a part of having a good relationship with our Heavenly Father. Amen. Help Him, Lord. So secondly, we are to pray in the Spirit. I'm mentioning this point secondly because of the way it's laid out in the Bible, but this is actually the most important point that we'll mention this morning. Praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Our, our prayers are to be prayed in the Spirit. And that doesn't mean just praying whenever you want to. If you're praying just to get a million dollars, or just to get a mansion on the hill, or just to tell God what you think you need, that's not praying in the Spirit. That's praying in covetousness. That's praying in the flesh. The Bible says in James chapter 4, Verses 2 and 3, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and ye cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. Look at what it says here. 
Ye lust and have not. This is speaking of having a desire for worldly things, but having nothing because you refuse to do what's needed in order to make use of the proper means to require what it is that you desire. Amen. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. This is speaking of that insurrection that comes against the happiness of other people. It's having a murderous spirit because of a desire to have what somebody else has and we cannot obtain that by honest means and yet we're not content with what God's given us. Ye fight in war and yet ye have not because ye ask not. This is speaking of going to law with other people over worldly things, making a big fuss about worldly things, fighting and quarreling and still not having what you desire despite all the trouble that you're putting yourself through. And yet there have always been those who ask God, yet they do not receive because they ask amiss. And asking amiss just simply means that when you ask God, you're not asking with respect to God's will. You're not asking with the intentions of doing good for others, for the glory of Christ, but rather you're asking in order to indulge yourself selfishly. That's not praying in the Spirit, folks. That's, right. That's, right. Amen. That's not praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit is an outflow of your relationship with God that's rooted in the Word of God. So when you're praying and your prayers are the outflow of a genuine relationship with God, you're not praying to a God you don't know. But you're praying to a God you can trust in. Yeah. Amen. You're praying to a God that you can depend upon and it's only the true children of God who can pray in the Spirit. Amen. This goes wrong along with what Melissa said while she was up here. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. It's only the true children of God who can pray in the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 16. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again, again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. These are those who are born again. These are those who are saved by the matchless grace of God. These are the children of faith. These are those who are under the control of the Spirit of God. Are you under the control of the Spirit of God today? I'm not just talking about being under the control of any spirit. I'm talking about being under the control of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Are you under control of the Holy Spirit today? Is the Holy Spirit regulating your thoughts? Is the Holy Spirit regulating your words and your conduct? Because it's those who are led by the Spirit of God who are the sons of God. Yeah. If you're led by the Spirit of God and you're a child of God by faith, you're an heir... Uh, to the kingdom of God. And Jesus Christ is a source of new life for you. There's no such thing as a Christian who has not received the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it may seem as if your prayers are going no higher than your lips, but we can know if you're a child of God, we've got a God who delights to hear the prayers of His people regardless of how we feel because it's His Spirit that dwells on the inside. Amen. But sadly today, I believe many are led by some other spirit. Yep. Amen. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. We need to be saved. By the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Amen? Praying in the Spirit also means that you're not just praying to be seen and you're not just praying to be heard by other people. Surely, none of us in this place would ever want to admit that we've ever prayed just to be seen or just to be heard by others. But have we not been guilty of this? I mean, it, it's actually easier to be guilty of this than you might think. Yeah. Amen. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself praying just like the Pharisees prayed. Yeah. That's right. 
I'm here to tell you, I've been guilty of it. I've been guilty of this. I've bowed my head in church before and prayed this long, elaborate prayer because I knew other people were around. I wasn't thinking like this, you know, uh, technically, per se, at the time. But maybe subconsciously this is going on. And I bowed in prayer and said, uh, uh, said some big elaborate prayer in church just to go home after the service. Thank you for the food, God. Amen. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Yeah. Amen. Is that praying in the Spirit? I don't think so. We need to pray in the Spirit. Thirdly, when we pray, we are to watch thereunto with all perseverance. Perseverance means persistence in anything that you undertake in life. Perseverance means that you continue to pursue what it is that you start. You started it, you're going to finish it. You're not going to quit. You're not going to give up. No doubt we've all found ourselves in some kind of dilemma where we've ran to God in prayer and we've prayed and we've prayed and we've prayed and it just doesn't seem as if God has given us the answer that we wanted, the answer that we'd hoped for. A loved one passed away. We didn't get the promotion. We didn't find a godly wife or a godly husband. Our loved one hasn't been saved. They've not trusted in Christ and it seems as if they're bent on destroying their life and yours. Have you ever been there? You've got problems that just haven't been solved and you've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed and it seems as if God hasn't given you the answer that you'd hoped for. We don't understand why we haven't received the answer we wished for when everything that we're praying for seems to be good and right. And then we'll get angry with God. But the question is, are you really praying in the context of your relationship with God? Because with God, there are other possibilities. I think we all too often forget that when Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, where was he? He was in prison. He was in prison. When he wrote this, Paul knew that this whole experience of being locked away in a dark and filthy prison, he knew that all of that was a part of God's loving relationship to him. How could it be that a loving father would allow his child to sit in a dark and a filthy prison? It was out of love for Paul because God knew that there were certain lessons that Paul needed to learn that he would not learn in any other context. There are certain lessons that we will go through in life where God is teaching us certain things that you're not going to learn any other way except to just go through what it is you've got to go through. He does this because He loves us. Amen? Amen. I'm not talking about just going through trials and problems because of bad choices that you've made. I'm talking about God's power being made perfect in your weakness. There is a difference, I can assure you. Paul, Paul knew more so than being a prisoner in a dark and a filthy prison that even more than that, he was a prisoner of Christ. Yeah. He was a prisoner of Christ first and foremost. Now, none of this means that God will never heal you or, or uh, heal your sickness or send you a godly spouse or, or give you a decent line of employment, but we're addressing how we are to respond when God doesn't answer our prayers the way that we'd like for Him to answer our prayers. And praying with all perseverance will help you to never lose sight of the enemy. Because I would like to remind us all this morning that there is a real devil. We have a real enemy out there and he's powerful and just like we mentioned Wednesday night, he's been on destroying your life. Yeah. Yeah. We need to be people who are going to watch with all perseverance and pray. Amen. Another aspect of watching with all perseverance is, is it, while praying is just simply giving thanks to God for the many blessings that He does give. 
and my the blessings that God gives. But if you let the devil have his way today, you'll never open your mouth and give God a drop of praise for the blessings He's given you. You'll never open your mouth and give God one bit of glory for all that He's done for you. You'll never share your testimony. You'll never try to teach anyone what it is to watch with all perseverance. And you'll let an unbelieving heart take charge despite the fact that God just performed a work inside of your life. If you want to be someone who watches with all perseverance while, while praying, give thanks to God. Give thanks to God for the many benefits that He has bestowed upon you by His marvelous grace. And if you haven't been doing this, start today. Yes. Amen. And fourthly, we are to make supplication for all saints. When we pray, our prayers should not just be big prayers or small prayers. We need to pray for the big sinners and the little sinners. Pray for all sinners, trusting that God has the power to save all of them. We need to pray big, we need to pray small, but there also needs to be a larger scope to our prayers. Our praying needs to be wide-ranging. We need to pray, the Bible says, to pray for all saints. Pray for all saints. All saints everywhere. All over the world. You know there are some countries in the world right now where the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is truly growing. It's growing. God is at work. God is opening hearts. God is opening eyes. And He's filling men and women with a passion and a zeal and a fervor to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Souls are being saved. God is being glorified. Hearts are being stirred. Lives are being impacted and changed forever. There are churches in these places that desperately need our prayers Amen. here today. We need to pray that they'll stand strong in the Lord. We need to pray that they'll stay true to the Gospel. Yes. In some of these places, there's harsh, harsh persecution. We need to pray that they'll stand firm even in the face of persecution. It's vitally important that we pray for all saints. I don't believe for a moment that this church would have been able to get off the ground and to stay open for over 13 years unless there were some people praying for us. Amen. People that we've never even met who prayed for us. People that we don't even know, we've never known, and we'll likely never meet them on this side of life. But they loved the Word of God and they loved the Lord enough to pray for all saints. I thank God for every saint of God who drove by our rented building on Gravelly Road from April of 2007 to September of 2011 and they saw a sign on the side of a block building that said Free Gift Gospel Mission and they said a prayer for us. I thank God for every saint of God who's drove by this location on Maple Street since September of 2011 and said a prayer for us. People that we've never known and will likely never meet. But they thought enough of God and God's Word to pray. And they honored this passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 6. And they passed by this location and they whispered a prayer even though they didn't know us personally. And we don't know them. And now, in the day of the internet, I thank God for every saint of God who may even be on another continent in this world who saw a video or read a blog post and they prayed for us. We'll never meet them in this life, but they prayed for us. Friends, this is the type of praying people that we need to be. Yeah, amen. But sadly today it seems that many people are far more interested in attacking all saints instead of praying for all saints. Amen? We need to pray. We need to pray for our missionaries, but not, not only for missionaries, but we need to pray for those who are seldom seen, the meekest and the lowliest of God's people. Pray for them also. 
I don't know about you, but, but when I get to heaven, I want to be able to look at multitudes of people that I've never met and tell them I prayed for you. So pray, friends. Pray for all saints. Pray for those all over the world and those right here in our community. So my purpose in preaching this message today is to build you up. It's not to bring you low. It's not to make you feel like a failure uh, because, of the, because of the way you've prayed. or It's not to make you feel like a, a failure if you've not prayed enough or if you've not prayed the right way. So I'm here today to simply remind you that prayer is an outworking of your relationship with God. It's not difficult to grasp that prayer is your way of responding when the Holy Spirit prompts you to cry out to God in a number of capacities. It could be offering thanks. It could be interceding for someone else. It could be confessing and repenting of sin. I, I mean, this is not a list of duties that are designed to burden you down. This ought to encourage you. When we pray as Christians, we can be assured that we're not praying alone. Not only did Jesus Christ pray perfectly when He walked upon this earth, but He's still praying today. Yes, amen. Hebrews chapter 7. Would you turn with me please? We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 7. And I'm going to start bringing it to a close for this morning. But verse 25 in Hebrews chapter 7 Here the Word of God says, Wherefore He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. Yeah, Praise God. Christ is right now making intercession for us all. He's not praying as He did in the days of His flesh. He appears in person for you. He's interceding for you, child of God, right now. He's, interce he's interceding for you, removing the charges that Satan has leveled against you. He's bestowing blessings. He, he's making recommendations upon the prayers of God's people. And He's the only one who's qualified to do so as the great high priest. And the next two verses bear this out. Verse 26 and 27. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from, from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins. Aren't you glad we've got a perfect Savior? Yeah. He had no sin. Yeah. Amen? He had no sin. And then for the peoples, for this he did once, when he offered up himself. Well, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. But not only that, but the Spirit will intercede for us. According to Romans 8.26, you might want to jot this verse down and read it later, Romans 8.26. But Romans 8.26 reminds us that during those times in your life when you don't know what to pray for, and you don't know how to pray, the Spirit will intercede for you with groanings which cannot be uttered. That's too deep for words. Amen? Thank God for a Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who will intercede for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 8, 26. Read it sometime. So, remember to pray, beloved. Amen? Remember to pray. Pray in all types of situations. Pray for all people. Pray persistently. And then when you put on that whole armor of God, you'll be connected to the source of power that you need and you're not going to be like that fighter plane that's loaded down with all of these weapons but you have no power to use it. If this message has been used of God, to speak to hearts this morning. And you'd like to start today. Maybe you've not been praying. 
as an outpouring of your relationship with God and you'd like to start today and you'd like to have your prayers be an outworking of your relationship with God and you don't know exactly where to start, listen, my dear friend, I invite you to practice on me. Amen. 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 Because I always need your prayers. I need the prayers of God's people that, that God would keep me from a spirit of compromise. I need the prayers of God's people that God would keep me from a spirit of fear. I need the prayers of God's people. We need to pray for one another that we'll be more like the apostles and the saints of old who were martyred for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And most of all, we need to pray for one another that we'll be more like Christ Himself who is our perfect example. Let's pray. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come humbly before you today. God, I pray that as this message is, has gone out today, God, that you would bless and move and give the increase according to your will. Oh God, we're trusting and depending upon you. Though we are imperfect, you are almighty. You are perfect. And I know 